And good evening. Uh, this is Asani Pettiford, and tonight, every single Monday at 9 p.m., we will be having what we call our Infidelity Recovery uh, a Call on Facebook Live for all of those individuals who have been impacted by infidelity in any particular way. We want you to, we want you to be a part of this Facebook experience because we're going to give you exactly what you need to begin to restore your relationship. Let me simply say that... You know, we've been working with couples for quite some time and an overwhelming number of the couples who come to us are impacted in a tremendous way. And they're at a point where they just don't know what they want to do. Do they want to stay? Do they want to go? They're just not clear. And so what we do is we provide um, direction for them. We give them hope. We help them to begin to restore. And so the reality is this. If you've experienced infidelity, what you're going through may be somewhat different than what someone else you know who's gone through. Because ultimately, there are four types of an affair. Thank you. I love the comments. I love the likes and the loves. This is the first time I'm actually doing a Facebook Live, so I'm kind of getting used to this whole process. But I just wanted to share with you all that there are four types of an affair, okay? So affair number one is what we would call the one-night stand. So that is when an individual goes away on a business trip. They go away on vacation. Um, they go to a bar. They're in a secluded place all by themselves or amongst a group of people, and they have an affair. Now, this type of affair is very, very, very physical. There's no emotional connection. There's no attachment. No relationship um, is created from this experience. Usually, it's what we will call a one-time transactional sexual experience with another person. And this can happen one time or it can happen a number of times. So you have people who participate in what we call serial infidelity. And so if that is uh, what you've experienced, there's a very specific way that you can recover from that particular type of an affair. But the second type of an affair is what we will call emotional entanglement, okay? Emotional entanglement is a relationship that has occurred over the course of time. So let's just say I'm working with someone. I'm in close proximity with someone. I serve on the same board. I volunteer in the same ministry at church. I congregate with someone at the gym. I'm seeing this person on a regular basis. And it quote unquote starts off very platonic. But over the course of time, as we become familiar with each other and we begin to engage in quality conversation and spending quality time together, all of a sudden, develop um, feelings are developed. And now there's an emotional connection that wasn't there before. Now, one thing about uh, emotional affairs, they don't always lead to sex. Not every emotional affair is physical. However, when you talk to most people who've experienced it, the pain that they experience with an emotional affair is, I would say, a hundred times worse than those who have had physical affairs. Because there's one thing in a person's mind for you to physically be with someone else. But now that your heart and your mind and your emotions are with someone else, I feel like I've completely lost you forever. And so it's hard to kind of rebuild back from that, but there is a process. So the way that you recover from a, a one-night stand is completely different than the way that you recover from an emotional affair. Let me give you a couple of examples. There was a couple that um, we worked with a couple of years ago. This couple literally uh, was in a 40-year marriage, and the husband had a 25-year emotional affair with another woman. Now, what's interesting about this particular case, he never met the woman. I mean, this was a high school sweetheart. So what happened was he joined the military, he moved to another part of the country, and from that point forward, everything was a letter a phone call, an email. They were never physically together, but he was in a 25-year relationship with another woman. So every time holidays came around, he bought two gifts, he bought two sets of cards. His emotions and his feelings obviously were split. And over the course of time, it created a huge emotional disconnect with his spouse. So even though he never had physical sex with her, the impact that it had on his wife was completely overwhelming. So it's a, it's a very specific process to recover from that type of an affair. The third type of an affair is what we will call sexual compulsion. Now this is a person who would be considered a sex addict, someone who has to have sex all the time, possibly with multiple partners, and for some reason their partner is not enough. And so in this particular case, this requires a different type of recovery. It requires a particular specialist that can come in and assist 
uh, to restore that particular relationship. And then fourth, uh, which is a very common type, is what we know as the open-ended relationship. This speaks to a marital void in the relationship. So if there are problems, if there are issues, if there are circumstances that have yet to be resolved, and you know what, I've talked about it a thousand times, you already know what the deal is, you just won't get right, either we unconsciously drift off, right, in directions that become very vulnerable and we emotionally connect with other people or we intentionally go out and seek in others what we're no longer getting within our own relationship and so as you can see uh, the first type is what we would call the one night stand uh, the second type is emotional entanglement the third type is sexual compulsion and the fourth type is a marital void so whatever type of affair that you've gone through, you have to realize that it takes more than, I'm sorry, I won't do it again to recover. Because once you uh, find out about the affair, statistics suggest that it takes upwards of two years to completely heal and recover, it, recover from it. So in essence, once you've reached the second year anniversary of the discovery of the affair, it takes that length of time with help and assistance to completely overcome it so that there's no longer any relational residue that carries forth into the future of that relationship. But if couples do not seek the proper help, if they attempt to do it on their own, if they believe that we can get over it, all we need to do is just pray, you are sadly mistaken. Because you have to understand that as human beings, we're triune beings. We're spirit, we're soul, and we're body. And the biggest struggle that people have is in the area of their soul, because their soul is where their mind, their will, their emotions, their thoughts, their intellect, their imagination resides. And if someone has been cheated on in a relationship and doesn't understand the why of the affair, they just can't figure it out. And every time they ask questions, the answers that they get just don't make any sense. They're stuck in their mind as to why this happened. And think about it like this. If you've ever put a puzzle together before, hear this analogy. You go, to a, you go to a toy store, you buy a puzzle. There are pieces of a puzzle inside of a box. Now, the cover of the box has the image of what the puzzle is supposed to look like when all the pieces are together, right? So you open up the box, you take out the pieces, and you put them together, and you're constantly looking at the cover to make sure that, you know what, it lines up with the image that appears on the box. Makes sense. Now, you can struggle in this process particularly the more pieces you have. Now imagine if somebody gave you a puzzle, but they did not give you the cover of the box. So you have no clue what this thing looks like. Imagine it was a hundred piece puzzle, but they only gave you 75 pieces. So you struggle because you didn't know what it was supposed to look like and you had not enough pieces. So now there are gaping holes in this puzzle that you're trying to figure out. And oftentimes that's how it is for a partner who's trying to gain an understanding of what happens and no matter what they ask for, they're not getting the proper information. So what happens in that particular scenario, you're forcing someone to use their imagination to figure it out. You're forcing them to use their assumptions to figure it out. And nine times out of 10, they're wrong because the imagination could run wild. The imagination could be far worse than what the reality actually was. And so that is, that is why it's critically important that when an affair has occurred, some people have this, you know what, I'm taking this to the grave. I'm not going to tell her. I'm not going to tell them because if I tell them, it's over. I know my marriage is over. So I'd rather hold on to this. But what we've discovered working with couples is that Hurt partners are more pained, not by the deed that was done, but by the deception that came along with it. That in essence, people have said, I can deal with the deed, but the fact that you lied to me, but not only did you tell a lie, you've lived a lie. And so because you've lived a lie and you've had this well-crafted story that, 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 that came out to be untrue, now I begin to question you. Now I begin to question everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you go, every step you make. I don't even know who I'm dealing with anymore. So when people are apprehensive to really uh, releasing the information, I would, I would highly encourage you that people do not leave marriages because of infidelity. I'm going to say that again. Overwhelmingly, the majority of people do not leave a marriage because of infidelity. 
It's your unwillingness to do what's required as a result of the infidelity. So when you show up half-hearted, when you show up defensive, when you show up secretive, when you don't discover or expose what has happened, when you don't provide details, when you don't have a level of empathy, when you don't have a level of patience, when you don't have a contrite heart, when you don't seem to be an individual who has been changed by this experience and the negative impact it's had on the marriage, that's what causes people to leave. And so if you want to save your marriage, the best thing that you've got to do is tell it all. So there's a process that couples go through called the disclosure process, where all of the details come out, all of the gory details. And in that process, we're able to understand the why of the affair. Because if I can't mentally and intellectually understand why this occurred, then what that means is it's bound to possibly happen again because we haven't gotten to the root of it all. And what I found, which is, which is so interesting, is that when people cheat, if they do admit that there was an infidelity in, the, in that particular relationship, they will deny, they will lie about all of the circumstances surrounding the affair. So it's almost easier to admit that I was physically sexual with somebody than it is to admit that I had a heartfelt connection with them. Somehow that becomes the ultimate <laughs> detail that we have to leave out because if we reveal that, somehow it makes us much worse than the deed that was already performed. But I'm here to let you know that even though the truth hurts, the fact of the matter is the truth heals. And I've seen so many people bounce back and recover from infidelity when the truth came out. Now, there is a process of recovery, right? There is a process of restoring trust in the relationship. But if you are holding on to things that I find out three months later, a year later, what you're doing is you're bringing that person all the way back to the very beginning, ground zero again, to begin to restore the marriage. So it makes sense to just deal with everything at once, at one time, so that you can overcome it and move forward. And so some of the phases, there are generally six phases that couples must go through when they're trying to restore a relationship. Phase number one is the discovery process. That's when you first find out about the affair. Now, uh, the way that you find out can be sometimes more traumatic than, than others. Like I've had a couple where literally he walks into you know his bedroom and sees a naked man underneath his bed and his naked wife in the sheets. Now that's traumatic. That is a completely different experience than if you know you heard about it through a friend, if you heard about it through the grapevine, or if your spouse comes to you. All right, so the disclosure process is very, very, very important in terms of how that unfolds. But what happens is it's one of the most critical times in the entire relationship because it's at that moment where all of the emotions have been built up. At that moment, we are ready to leave. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to take it. We have no patience. We have no empathy. We want out. And so the best advice that I give people in that particular uh, time period is to, if you're struggling, should I stay or should I go, the best thing you can do is nothing. Because when you make decisions based upon emotions, you will soon regret the decision that you made. So if you're in anger, if you're in rage, if you're saddened, if you're depressed, that is the absolute worst time to make a life decision. Particularly if you have children, if you have uh, finances, obviously, that are tied to one another, if you have a lifestyle and a reputation, there are all types of factors that are involved in the decision of whether you should stay or go. So rather than asking somebody, do you want to stay or do you want to go, the better option is this. If an affair has occurred, go through the process of recovery, right, and let the recovery process answer the question as to whether you should stay or you should go. So if you find that the uh, offender, right, uh, the cheating partner has done all that they can to restore the relationship and they're showing up 100% of the time doing the right thing, they're repentant and they're doing all that's possible to, to, to reestablish the connection, then that's an indication that, you know what, it's worth staying. But I've dealt with couples where there were constant um, acts of infidelity, even throughout the recovery process. So for, uh, uh, you know, an unfaithful partner, they were actually just going through the motions. They didn't properly end the affair. They didn't disconnect emotionally. They were still in communication with that person. They weren't willing to make any sacrifices. They weren't willing to make any course corrections. And so that shows an individual who really doesn't want what they say that they want. At the end of the day, you can't pay attention to what people say. You got to pay attention to what they do. 
because results mean everything. So many people say, I love you, I want to stay, I wanna work out the relationship, but their actions are in complete contradiction to what it is that they say. So I say time will tell. The journey that you take someone through will ultimately determine whether that relationship is worth restoring or whether it's worth just moving forward. So that's phase one, the discovery phase. Then phase two is what we call the disclosure phase, which we just basically talked about, is revealing all of the details of the affair. So generally, you will have the hurt person who writes out a list of questions that they want to ask the unfaithful person. And that unfaithful person has to be completely honest about the details no matter how painful they are. And so one of the things that we talk about is the policy of radical honesty. Now, many counselors, many coaches, many therapists will say, not everything is worth saying. Don't share every detail. You know, if you mention this, you know, it'll wind up exploding in your face. Just don't do it, hold on to it. But I totally, totally disagree with that philosophy. Because as I said, all hidden things eventually come out. It's just a matter of time. And so the policy of radical honesty comes in four particular categories. Number one, we're talking about historical honesty, where you're honest about the past, either the past prior to our marriage or the beginning of our relationship, which represents now the past. Then there is emotional honesty, when we are completely honest about our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions and those things that we've kept inside. You know, when a relationship goes downhill, the first thing that's impacted is our communication. And oftentimes we suppress our feelings and our emotions and our opinions because we feel like our partner can't handle those things. But having a sense of emotional vulnerability is critical if you're going to restore a relationship. The third type of honesty is what we call current honesty. Current honesty means I know where you are. I can text you and you respond. I call you and you answer. Hours don't go by. Days don't go by and you're missing an action. And so you have all of these ridiculous excuses. I left my phone in the car. My battery died. I was in a meeting. Like all of these ridiculous things that you continue to tell, hoping that it will work, but the partner can see right through that. And so when you are not experiencing or participating in current honesty by being open and honest about your whereabouts, it breeds distrust. Then the fourth component, right, of radical honesty is what we will call future honesty. Future honesty says I'm going to be open and honest about my future plans and future intentions. So I'm going to tell you where I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to let you know about decisions that I'm making for uh, later in the day and for the next day and for the next week. Why? Because if you're at the point where you're making independent decisions because you're single minded and no longer married minded, now I can't trust your motives. I don't know what your, what your true intent for what it is that you're going to do. I can't trust you. And so the trust building phase is a critical process in the recovery process because whether an affair has taken place or not, don't you know that one of the biggest issues that couples struggle with is trust? Either they don't trust their partner because of things that were done in the past, or they don't trust their partner because of broken promises, things that they said they were going to do that they didn't do. There's a, an incalculable number of reasons why trust dissipates over the course of time in a relationship. So this is a phase that really takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. I remember I was on the Bill Cunningham show a couple years ago. And if you don't know what the Bill Cunningham show is, it's like equivalent to uh, uh, one of those crazy daytime talk shows back in the day, like a Jerry Springer or a Maury Povich. And I remember there was a couple who had experienced uh, infidelity. And the boyfriend was just like, I wish you would just get over it. Like somehow... I cheated on you last month. It's been 30 days. Get over it. And she was just like, could you tell this man that you just can't get over an affair? It's just not that easy. And she was absolutely right. If you don't go through the recovery process the right way, it, you just can't get over it. And here's why. If a month ago, if a year ago, check this, if a decade ago an affair has occurred and it hasn't properly been dealt with, when it occurred, it created a wound, right? And when that wound was created, it was painful. It was raw, right? Now, over the course of time, that wound closes up. Have you ever had an accident before 
where you've ripped your skin or had a huge laceration and either you allowed it to heal on its own and it didn't properly heal or maybe you went to a hospital or a doctor, the emergency room, and they you know, put stitches in you, but they didn't do it the right way. So it healed incorrectly. And then there are times throughout the course of the year, depending upon the weather and the season, where you'll experience pain in the place where you initially had that wound. And then sometimes that wound will reopen and you have to get it attended to again. Well, that's what happens when you don't properly heal from an affair. So there's something called emotional triggers. Emotional triggers can be caused by a day of the week, a time of the day, a color, a smell, a scent, a song on the radio, a television show. Anything can spark an emotional trigger. And when these emotional triggers happen, that wound reopens. And it's just as raw today as it was a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago. And so that's why it's important that both of you do everything that's possible to restore the relationship and the trust building phase is so critical and it's a two-way street because this is the reality if I am the offender and you are the one who's been cheated on that's right I'm talking to you if I do everything that's um, that I'm supposed to do I'm dotting every I I'm crossing every T I'm making phone calls I'm letting you know where I'm at I'm accountable I got accountability partners you know you have software on my website or on the computer so you know what websites I'm going to I'm doing everything right right but you still have ought and unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness on the inside no matter what I do it will not be good enough it's not gonna work if you as the hurt partner says you know what I'm willing to forgive Let's start all over. Let's move forward. Let's 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 have a new lease on life when it comes to our relationship. But I'm still doing the same things. I'm still involved in the same behaviors and activities. There's no change in me. Then there is no trust. So trust is a two way street. So there are roles and responsibilities and obligations of the offender and there are roles, responsibilities and obligations of the one who has been hurt. And if you both are doing your part, you're able to make a quantum leap forward. And it doesn't take as long as it would take if you did not do these particular things. Then we go into the next phase is what we will call understanding the why of the affair. This is so critically important. And a part of that process is really knowing how to shut that relationship down and make sure that it is totally gone. Because I've seen situations where the hurt partner relied and trusted that the unfaithful partner ended the relationship, but it was never over. They were still in contact and communication. So when I'm working with couples, I take them through a very, very specific process to ensure that it is over once and for all. And what happens in that moment, trust is regained. You know, the fact that we were willing to do this together, there were no secrets. There, there were no private conversations because we were concerned about offending the affair partner. So what happens in that particular situation, the spouse feels offended. Like, why did, would you care about protecting their feelings and their emotions when I'm the one in the relationship who's been hurt? So your allegiance has to be for your spouse. And the message has to be made clear that you're working on your marriage and all forms of communication, you know, are going to cease and be over and that you were wrong for what you did and willing to do whatever you need to do to restore it. Like the messaging has to be right because if the messaging isn't right, that I'm telling you is an experience that goes wrong. And then when we do that, we kind of enter into what we call the forgiveness phase. And the forgiveness phase is probably one of the biggest issues that people struggle with. Now, the reality is all of us have a different experience when it comes to forgiveness. Some of us experienced that in our home. Some of us did not. Some of us held on to things forever. I know people who have been hurt by siblings or by their parents or by extended family member and for years have not spoken to one another. So if you have a habit, a practice, um, and a pattern of not forgiving other people, then you've trained yourself not to be able to forgive your spouse. So one of the things that we talk about is who out there who is a person of significance in your life? Who you need to ask forgiveness of and they need to ask of your forgiveness. What relationships are, are not healed the way they need to be healed? Because whatever is out there, it could have an impact on your existing relationship and how you think the way you think, how you respond the way you respond, and how you do what it is that you do. So the forgiveness process, and I'm not going to go into it because it's very, very deep, but I will say this. In church, we're taught the principle of forgiveness and it sounds good. 
and it's scriptural. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But even though we have a principle, we haven't learned proper application. We don't know how to walk it out. And so we think we have forgiven our partners. But weeks later, months later, years later, there's still that pain. There's still that passive aggressiveness. There's still that uh, resentment that we hold on to because we haven't properly healed. And so I take couples through a what I call a system of forgiveness that really works and allows you to begin to reconnect. Now, once you've done that, now you're entering into uh, the rekindling phase where you're trying to reestablish the intimacy and the chemistry and the passion that you once had. And that could be a very tricky, awkward phase because now when we're intimate, all I can think about is who you were with. And even though I wasn't there, my mind and my imagination begin to wonder. And so now when you touch me, are you thinking about her or are you thinking about him? And so we've seen where, you know, we've had people who have taken uh, the affair partner's face and put it on their spouse's body. Or we've, you know, all types of things. So there was a stranger, in essence, sleeping in the bedroom. All types of things go on in bedrooms. And so we kind of deal with all of those intimate details to help get couples back on track. These are just the basic phases that you have to go through. The final phase is really when you rebuild the foundation for a relationship. A lot of times, and this may sound weird, Relationships, if they go through the proper recovery process, the relationships are stronger after the affair than they were before the affair. Because now they took the time to build the proper foundation. They have the building blocks in place. They have all of the questions out, all of the issues that need to be resolved. And there's literally a plan for the future of that relationship. And so even though it can appear to be a daunting task for people, I highly encourage you that this is something that you do for the future of your of your marriage. And it's critical. So listen, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to go. Now, this is my first time doing a Facebook Live. I see that there are comments uh, and questions possibly that I haven't read because I'm learning how to use it. So forgive me if I haven't acknowledged anything you've said, though I see that the stream is going. <clears throat> I'll end by saying this. If you've been impacted by infidelity, I don't care if it, you just found out about it yesterday or you're still struggling with something that happened over a decade ago. It is not too late to get the help that you need. This is not something that you can do on your own. Let me give you this example. If you've ever been on a plane before, okay, one thing about a plane, no matter how many times that plane has flown from one location to another, no matter how skilled the pilot is, no matter how well built and equipped the actual plane is. When a plane lifts off of the ground, 90% of its journey is off course. 90%. So the question is, how in the world does it get to its final destination? Well, there's a radar system in the cockpit that's constantly guiding that plane, changing its latitude and longitude lines, making sure that there are course corrections, so that eventually it gets to its final destination. What we have found is that when couples attempt to recover and restore their relationship on their own, 90% of their journey is off course. And even though they have the best of intentions, as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, you don't know enough. You're not skilled enough. You're operating in your own skin. You're seeing things from your own perspective. You have your own mindset. You need a third party individual who specializes in affair recovery, not a general practitioner. For if I went to my doctor and I said, I have a knee problem, if it's a good doctor who's a family doctor, he should refer me to a specialist because that's outside of his area of expertise. But what we do is we go to the pastor who has good intentions and who has word, but may not have the experience in helping a couple recover effectively. We go to a general practitioner, like a general practice counselor or therapist, and their approach could be good and may not be good depending upon their area of specialty. What I'm suggesting is that whoever you go to, whether a pastor, a counselor, a therapist, another couple who you consider to be a marriage mentor, find someone who has knowledge and skill sets to get you where you need to go. One of the things that I always say is that we are guilty of sharing our problems with people who share our problems. So we're always going to people who represent our our problem for an answer. You should go to people who represent your solution, who have your answer. So the question is, who do you listen to? 
We wind up always listening to the wrong people, getting the wrong advice, going in the wrong direction, and then we wonder why our relationships don't, don't go right. You've got to put your trust in someone who's more skilled and knowledgeable in, than you in a particular area to give you what you need. Now, when you do this and you're committed to the process, you can have a marriage that you've never even dreamt of. Is it possible that things could get better after experiencing something like this? Absolutely. There are many people who have said that cheating, infidelity, is comparable to death. There have been some who have said cheating, infidelity, is comparable to rape. It's such a traumatic experience, the impact that it has on people could be completely different. Many people experience post-traumatic stress disorder from what an affair. So one night of pleasure or one season of pleasure can bring about a lifetime of pain. But if you take the proper steps, if you seek the proper help, you have all of the building blocks in place to restore your marriage. So listen, every single Monday at 9 p.m., we will be having these Facebook Live experiences. I'm going to learn how to do this better. I'm going to take your questions <clears throat> and we're going to be responding to them. And it's going to be a great Q&A session and it will be like a group counseling session. That's my promise to you. For all those that are interested in a free 30-minute discovery session if you've experienced infidelity, I encourage you to go to my website at couplesacademy.org. That is couplesacademy.org and you can sign up for a complimentary discovery session with me. Do something. Listen, I just want to let you know that there's still hope for you. There's still healing for you. That regardless of how bleak your situation may be, regardless of how confused you may be in this season in your life, guess what? You may be in darkness, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've seen so many couples overcome the pain of infidelity because I've helped them in their journey and recovery process. We focus on both the marital recovery as well as the individual recovery process because the way that the hurt partner has to recover is completely different than the way that the unfaithful partner has to recover. They're two completely different journeys. And so when you focus on their individual as well as their marital, you're able to take a quantum leap into a phenomenal future. Thank you all for participating. Please like, please share this video. You know, once it's uploaded, I want you to tell as many people as you can about the service that Couples Academy is providing. Uh, we're going to be doing this on our Couples Academy page. I did it on, on my page tonight because many people aren't necessarily receiving the notifications because they're not on that page. They haven't liked it. So that's what I'm asking you to do. Spread the word. Get your free 30-minute session. Sign up tonight. I'll see you soon. Love you, Facebook.